Good evening. Welcome to BS and Beer. I'm Travis Brungart calling in from Kansas City. I've got some weird technical difficulties. The screen on my laptop won't work tonight, so I'm using my phone. So I apologize for the crummy background, potential audio problems. Any tech stuff, just put it on me. My fault. Sorry for that. Uh, wouldn't be the BS and Beer show if we didn't have tech trouble. Uh, of course, the BS and Beer show includes BS, which in this case stands for Building Science. Uh, tonight's topic is crafts in conjunction with building science, and we are very excited to be joined by the Modern Craftsman. Uh, of course, that's in reference to the Modern Craftsman podcast, but individually, uh, we've got uh, John Herhan, uh, Nick Schiffer, and Tyler Grace joining us, and we're real excited to talk to them this evening. Um, I already introduced myself, but I failed to introduce my delicious beverage. Uh, my man Dan sent me a Double the Jams Pina Colada Sour Ale, so all you IPA uh, high bitters <laughs> content lovers can mock me quietly to yourselves. And that's a, uh, that's, a wi- see that's a wine cooler or a beer. <laughs> it's a beer. It's a delicious beer with, with sour notes. Uh, I won't apologize for my beer. Uh, I want to just take a quick second to encourage the local BS and beer chapters that have sprung up all over the place. Uh, we're really excited about uh, sharing that message and supporting those guys any way we can. Guys and gals, uh, any way that we can. Uh, we're global. We've got friends in Australia. Talk to your people. If you don't have a chapter in your area, you should start one. If there is a chapter in your area, get in the mix. I know a lot of it's all virtual now, but there are opportunities. So uh, take advantage. If there's anything we can do to help you to get it started, reach out. We're really happy to do that. Uh, I'll thank our wonderful media partners, Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building Magazine, and then I'll pass it off to Emily. Hey guys, Emily Matram, architect here in Maine, and uh, I won't judge you for your sour beer while I'm drinking water tonight. So, you know, sometimes you have to. Um, If you're new to Zoom, uh, the chat box is usually very lively during the whole conversation. So feel free to post in the chat box, but please make sure you check uh, all attendees and panelists or it only goes to the panelists. And if you're on your cell phone, I think it almost always auto defaults back after every comment. So just double check that you're posting to everybody when you're posting in the chat box. Um, And if you're still seeing Kylie on the screen, hover over it, click the three dots and say hide non-video participants so that you can and see the six of us. Otherwise, I don't know if there are any other technical things. If you're, I can't imagine after 2020, you're new to Zoom anyway. But if you are, uh, feel free to ask me questions in the chat box. Otherwise, Fine Home Building sends out a reminder every week about the show. But if you want more information, join our mailing list on the bsandbeershow.com. You can join our mailing list and you'll get an update of what this week's show is going to be and who our guests will be. So Um, Tonight we're going to do introductions, backgrounds, uh, get talking, and then we'll do audience questions near the end. So um, I'm going to kick it off to Mike to give some announcements. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Mike Maines in Maine. I'm a designer and occasional builder. Uh, Tonight I am drinking Original Sin Pear Cider. That's actually pretty good. And when that's gone, I'll switch over to a switchback switchback ale. Let's see, uh, on, for announcements, on January 26th, uh, AIA New York will be hosting a webcast featuring uh, video conversations between designers and home builders for lead homes and passive house, um, followed by a roundtable discussion moderated by Zach Semke of Passive House Accelerator. So uh, search AIA New York or Passive House Accelerator for that. Um, and also, if you like BS and beer, uh, check out Passive House Accelerator's Global Happy Hour every Wednesday, and they have a few other um, events now, too, that are fun. Uh, for upcoming events, uh, Better Buildings by Design is an annual conference put on by Efficiency Vermont. Um, online this year, February 2nd to 4th, the conference theme is Resilient Energy, and Emily and I will be presenting on The Pretty Good House. Uh, at 8 a.m. I just learned. <laughs> so <laughs> nobody's going to watch that, but you can catch the recording. Uh, an- another event, uh, many of you may know uh, mean old Bill Robinson. He's a BS and Beer regular and founder of uh, BS and Red Beans in New Orleans. Um, he's also involved with Skills USA, uh, an organization dedicated to closing the trade skills gap. He is look- Bill is looking for industry professionals who might be willing to help with judging projects across 30 to 40 states for one day in June. If you can help, reach out to Bill uh, at bill 
at traintobuild.com and I'll put a link in the chat box. Um, two more announcements, then we can move on to the fun part. Uh, building science leaders and friends of BS and Beer, Christoph Irwin, Miguel Walker, and their positive energy team in Austin, Texas have opened their discussion group, the Building Science Philosophical Society, to anyone who wants to join. We'll put a link to that. And they also have an excellent monthly podcast called The Building Science Podcast. Uh, brilliant guys and always fun to listen to. Uh, last but not least, we have selected our next book club book. Um, our friend Jacob Diva Recusen wrote a book called Essential Building Science, Understanding Energy and Moisture in High Performance House Design. Um, so we'll put a link to that. Um, we encourage you to buy it through the publisher New Society um, instead of Amazon. So uh, the publisher and author actually get a couple of dollars out of it. Um, and we'll, and we'll re be reviewing that book late March, early April, sometime around then. Um, and I think that is it. And I will kick it over to Travis to introduce tonight's guests. And Travis is muted. Oh, no. I told you the technical difficulties are going to keep flowing. <laughs> Enjoy the ride, folks. Um, no, I have the pleasure of introducing these guys because I've been a fan of their podcast for a long time and uh, have read articles that they've written. I've uh, met them briefly at the Final Building Summit and was super impressed with them. So uh, without further ado, I'll start with John Horan, who grew up watching this old house. He landed his first job as a laborer once he could drive in 1996. He quickly progressed to a carpenter apprentice, carpenter, and then lead carpenter. While gaining field experience, he earned a degree in construction management from Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston, Massachusetts. Then he worked as a project manager and director of operations for both Boston-based and Wellesley-based companies. John is currently co-owner of Vintage Builders, working day-to-day -day with clients, architects, designers, and tradespeople. Say hello, Johnny, and tell us what you're drinking. What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me. I am drinking Maine Beer Company Mo Pale Ale. And you're on the job site? It looks like you got yeah, work going I on am. there, man. Yeah, I am. It is. It's actually a green screen. <laughs> no, it's my house. It's my office. It's almost finished. I've been telling my wife that for three years. Since Keep we started this podcast. Going, it's solid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Painful. It never gets old. Almost as painful as that write-up. I need to change that tomorrow. I was thinking oh. that was pretty legit, dude. Yeah, I was like, I have zero accolades. <laughs> like, uh, you want me to make something up on the fly, Tyler? I'll I mean, go something. for it. Anything like now, all right, let me better. do Nick next. Let me right. do Nick next, and then we'll go to Tyler. And I'll make I was, you can just, yeah, like I was a rodeo clown for a while. <laughs> I got you. Hey, Nick Schiffer is the owner of NS Builders in Boston, Mass, a, a team of young craftsmen who put thoughtful craftsmanship and design into every project. Nick started his, his business in the back of his parents' minivan when he built his art teacher a storage shed. Today, he runs a successful high end residential remodeling business in Boston and services the city and surrounding towns. Constantly challenging himself and his team. There's nothing standard about their approach. Nick, what are you drinking tonight, man? What's going on? What's up, man? I am drinking Neon Rainbows Hazy IPA by Ami. Very respectable. Yeah. Is, is it opened? It is open. I just cracked it. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I also have a coffee and a water, but I'm just mixing it up over here. You know. But it was just for show. Locked and loaded, man. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Nick's baby's due tomorrow, so it's pretty awesome that he took. Three, no, no, no. Uh, Let's correct that. Three. It was three days ago. No and, way. Yeah, we're 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 still waiting. <laughs> oh, well, I bet your wife is thrilled that you're spending your evening with us. Then, man, hang. Oh in yeah. There. I mean, you're definitely not her best friend right now. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's on time for Nick. Nope. Oh, <laughs> we, no, we joke about it with head. podcasts and projects. Yeah. Oh, we haven't started the fun yet, but it's already fun. This is great, guys. Uh, we also are joined tonight by Tyler Grace. He's the owner of TRG Home Concepts in Medford, New Jersey. Uh, it's an interior remodeling contracting company focused primarily on kitchens, bathrooms, and finished carpentry, which is a tremendous departure from his professional wrestling background. His mission is to deliver a quality product to his clients while creating and maintaining value through efficiency and judicious project coordination. He can also bench 350. Come at him, bro. What's up, bro. Tyler? Uh, not too much. Just getting back from the gym, you know, um, I still, I still like, I have this pipe dream that I'll be able to go back to the old, the old days of professional wrestling, but I don't know. It's difficult to scale that business. So I'd rather just work with myself and one other person and drive myself into the ground that way doing carpentry. <laughs> the body takes a hit either way, brother. Yeah. <laughs> but other than that, everything's great. Um, drinking coffee cause I'm tired. Well, I appreciate you staying up with us. That's it for the introductions. 
uh, we wanted to kind of start into a discussion just like right out of the gate. And I, I threw out some ideas uh, for questions that I was bouncing around. But I, I would love to give you guys an opportunity to kind of introduce yourselves and tell us more what's going on with you lately. Uh, you want to start since we're already looking at you, Tyler, or I'm looking at you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, what's going on in life, business, everything? Give us the the Cliff's Notes rundown with TRG. What what projects are you are you doing right now? What's the the building science thoughts cooking in your head at TRG? Because oh. I'm guessing probably not a ton of stuff, but I know you do a ton of crazy paint prep, and I always think about the uh, the impact that you're having on the world. Yeah, and write I'm, hateful stuff in the comments, just like I'm, everyone else, right? I'm probably not doing a great job on that end. Um, most of our work's remodeling work in older homes. So it's it's tough, um, to be completely honest, to integrate a lot of the newer technology. Um, it just it feels as though the impact is so small on the scale that we can. I definitely could do a better job of, uh, I feel like possibly recycling more reusing materials uh i know with like paint and prep you're going through stuff a ton and and dumping it out but um we're we're kind of doing the same thing grinding out we have a, a fair amount of work ahead of us a lot of remodels um a kitchen um <clears throat> staircase job um what else is going on i feel like i have too much work on my plate to even even recall what's going on but it's nothing nothing crazy nothing out of the normal um the normal stuff that i i typically do it's me and one other guy right now and just kind of putting our hours in trying to take off bite off a little bit as we can and get that schedule down so that we're not so overwhelmed nice that's that's solid background i'll accept that and just for anyone who was easily fooled i I totally lied about the professional wrestling in the bench. I have no idea what your bench is, no, Tyler. If, no, if I, I disrespected you with a 350, my bad. No, I mean, I don't either. I don't think I ever have tried, but um, I mean, 350 sounds good. That sounds impressive. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> Maybe squat 350. Probably For the record, not. that is impressive, Tyler. <laughs> yeah. Nah. Maybe squat. I, mean, I could like leg press 350. Oh, yeah. Totally. It's about Deal. It. <laughs> Well, how about you, Nick? You want to give us a little update? Introduce yourself better than I introduced you. Tell us what's going on. What's cooking, man? Yeah, you did. I mean, you did a pretty good job. But we have uh, a handful of projects going on. Like you said in the introduction, primarily, we you know have been a remodeling contractor uh, for the better part of my career. Been involved in some new construction projects for other companies as well as one under our belt. But looking into this year, we have uh, three, possibly four new construction projects uh, that are going to be on our schedule, uh, which I'm super excited about. We, you know, looking back into some of the remodeling, you know, building science has always been one of those things that have been daunting, to be honest. Uh, there's so much information out there. Um, and I think we've used our Modern Craftsman podcast as a, uh, an opportunity to learn from a lot of those people. Uh, I know myself, I've taken a lot of what uh, some of the guests have said and tried to implement it into remodeling. Uh, and I, and I, I would say that we've done a fair job at it and we've certainly improved our effort efforts and put a lot more thought into our approach, but I'm excited from the new construction aspect of how can we improve and control something from the very ground up. Uh, so really looking forward to that. That's awesome. I'm with you there, man. Uh, how about you, Johnny? What's going on, man? What are you doing? Absolutely nothing. I've been home all That's day. That's why that office isn't done. Get to work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean, we got a lot of projects going on. It's fun. Uh, a bunch of new constructions, some remodels, uh, everything in between. And yeah, to echo Nick's point or, or discussion is that building science is always that underlying thing. You want details. Why can't building science be part of those details? And it, it's something that crosses my mind daily as you walk up and see the assembly of a house go together. This is our opportunity to kind of make an impact for that house. Like I live in an old house. So does Tyler, Nick remodeled his. Um, but it's like, I just know the drafts. I got, I got a space heater. It's a brand new room. I had a space heater right behind me. Like this is all closed cell foam and yet it's still cold. Cause the old heating system I tied into doesn't really work that well. So it's, I think you can build an amazing house in lots of details, but um, if it's not comfortable uh, and it's not healthy, then what's the point? Well said. Uh, 
I have to apologize again uh, because I'm on my phone. My laptop's kind of fuzzy tonight. I don't know what the problem was. I don't have any of my notes to go on. I'm way off script and I'm just kind of punting. So if my fellow hosts can come in through clutch and uh, hit up some of the high points, <laughs> the questions were prepared. I am all over that. Uh, but I, I think we're just going to have a great conversation tonight, guys. I really appreciate you joining us. Sound like us. us. I feel like we, I don't, have we ever had a script? Ever? I think we, I think no. we tried that one time. We used to have a whiteboard, remember? We used to try No, the topics. scripts made it too long. That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, it was definitely over three hours. <laughs> Well, Mike is next say, level organized. Go ahead, Emily. Oh, I was going to say, too long. All of your podcasts are like three hours. I got to listen to them in like parts. That, that's good. <laughs> like I'm going to have to it, come back to that. It holds you out till the next week. <laughs> uh, till the next week? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the next day. You know, listen right. to them consecutively. It'll probably be consolidated into like 15 minutes. Of just information. Like just Doug's recap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> We just take the transcript, take out like the last 15 minutes, but maybe that's a good uh, discussion point here on the difference between craftsmanship and building science and like, where does one end and another start? You know, it's the same with like, when you have a three hour podcast, how do you decide what to cut? <laughs> None. Well, well you mean, don't, right? <laughs> right. But the, it's funny. I, I read some of the questions, Travis, about craftsmanship and comparing it to building science. And, you know, I've been thinking of it since you, since you wrote that, and I don't think there really is a start stop. It's this blend. And, you know, I think, you know, if you guys listen to the podcast, you hear John and I kind of get into what, what craftsmanship is and, you know, and uh, innovation and technology r ruining, maybe I'm, maybe I'm paraphrasing John, but, you know, changing what craftsmanship is uh, in nowadays construction. But I feel as though it's just like what John said, it's we have this opportunity when we're building to correct things, to build things better, to, to be more considerate, to be, you know, more thoughtful in our approach. And it can be as simple as, uh, you know, being uh, better with our envelope all the way, you know, all the way to the finishes of the project, you know, and Travis, you mentioned paint for Tyler. It's like, there's considerations there that can be attributed to craftsmanship, but also can be attributed to, you know, building science, you know, if one may argue that no oil paint, you know, the old school method of, of brushing the oil, that's craft, that's real craftsmanship, not the, not this new water-based stuff that's super healthy and, and good for you. Um, my, my opinion on that is, is, is wildly different where it's, it's about the, the knowledge and the efforts that someone takes in to, to put something together at their very best of ability. Yeah, does craftsmanship? Ha I think it should encompass building science. Doesn't need to be think, separate. Yeah, I think it is building science uh, for sure. Um, and you actually said something, Johnny, earlier, which is what how I practice, which is if it's beautiful but you can't live in it, what was the point? Yeah. You know, there's a if it's if I'm sitting here and I'm freezing and you know the the crown molding is absolutely gorgeous and you know the dovetail drawers in my million dollar kitchen is fantastic but I'm freezing then I mean we live in Maine so maybe that's just <laughs> far for the course <laughs> the eighteen hundreds farmhouse and you're just gonna be cold so I always say that durability is a function uh, of aesthetic to a certain point. You know, if, if it's not beautiful, someone will tear it down and replace it with something that is, that they do want to live in. So if, if Johnny's hand cut dovetails are in those drawers, that kitchen lasts an extra 10 or 15 years before someone can bear to part with it. So I, I totally agree that there's, there's an inter, uh, interwoven relationship um, that extends beyond just, you know, checking on the physics of something, but it, it's, it's really hard to quantify. And for me, it's extremely hard to determine where that line uh, gets blurry. Um, I, I guess one of the things that I was really compelled by uh, just listening to you guys uh, over the, is it years now on podcasts? It's years, like three. Are you guys going on three years? Three, I feel yeah. like it's like 15. <laughs> Dog years. <laughs> nice. Well, over the years, listening to you guys, th there's been some really compelling conversations. Specifically, I remember the one that uh, we had been bogey on. And you kind of went down a rabbit hole on uh, on panelization. 
and I think that's kind of what Nick was was alluding to is when uh, John was sort of trying to defend the the idea that you you lost some of the soul of the build uh, when you aren't putting hands on the material to make it come together to realize your vision. And that was something that I I really had to stop and think about for a long time. I mean, I think Nick and, and Ben kind of beat you up about that, Johnny, but I really wanted to think it over for myself because it seems to me that there is something very emotional and personal in what we do. Um, I mean, you guys can can speak to it better than I, but I, I definitely feel like there's something uh, there's something to be lost when you separate the person from the process. Uh, but I don't know if that flies in the face of material efficiency to a level where now we're being irresponsible, you know. And I think that's where the complexity is, and and that's that's why I wanted to go further in this conversation. I think it's tough, and I think that it has to be a blend. I. I, I would say that the biggest issue um, from a budget perspective is like, I feel like you spend your money on energy efficiency, uh, building science, or you spend it on details of a home that make it beautiful. And it's not until you get right now, it's not until you get into a s- extremely high end market that you can really marry those two. Like you can to a certain extent, but I feel like so many people are forced to pick between one or the other like are you going to upgrade your insulation package and your air sealing or are you going to spend that on your kitchen and I think that um, most people at that point are going towards the latter because not everyone's staying in the same location Um, you know people aren't necessarily building their forever homes and I don't know if they've ever fully understood living in a house that could be energy efficient or comfortable that they really even value that. So I think that's something that we're all going to battle. And I think that for myself, I didn't get into the industry and I don't enjoy carpentry because of uh, like thermal efficiency or getting into the building science of things. And that's, that's just not what I enjoy. So I have to make more of a concerted effort to um, integrate that into my building practices. That would be the responsible thing. And I think on the design end, it's it's ensuring that you're building um, to a certain aesthetic, to certain design principles where those people, you know, the building science aspect of it may come naturally or that may be what they're really into. And then they have to put a, li- a little bit more effort into the aesthetic design of things. And uh, I would say that, you know, it, it's tough to blend those two and everyone has to make an effort to do so. Yeah, I'd second that. And, you know, to kind of expand on that a little bit, I feel as though oftentimes it's the middle class that really suffers here again, where it's, you know, they're you're making compromises already. You're trying to get the most bang for your buck where it may be a more elaborate uh luxury home or, or large scale home that's really architect driven. And there's this incredible amount of detail in, you know, from architecture and design that they tend to spend more time with that, the envelope and the building science of it, because there the, there's money there to do so where you, you scale that back and you're dealing with a home that might, you know, be more cost conscious and, you know, appeal to the masses. They're, to Tyler's point, they, they are, they're going for, I think someone just commented in the chat, they're going for the fancy countertops, you know, instead of, you know, a better performing home because it's easier to sell. Someone walks a home, you know, we've had this conversation. I think Kyle Mack was on and we talked about a project where I think, I believe it was him, um, but they, they built two homes and one was a hundred thousand dollars next, you know, more than the, the neighbor. And, there was no, nothing to quantify that besides the fact that it was a better performing home. And, you know, the, the people that are pulling up, it looks the same. It seems the same. It has the same finishes, but why would I pay a hundred thousand dollars more? And, and to, again, is, can someone actually appreciate that? Oh, you, I'm going to pay less per month. Well, how much less? Oh, well, the, the math, you know, the math on my heating bill, that's going to take me seven years to recoup that cost. I don't even know if I'll be here for seven years. So it is, it's this weird balance between it's like building science and design, but it's also the balance of the financial aspect of it and whether or not the the project has the financial capabilities of kind of going quote unquote all out on that side of it, or if there's 
additional forethought going into it where you can make a lot of these practices, you know, more streamlined and easier to uh, easier for anyone to really achieve them, you know, to make a reference like zip sheathing. It's like they've made this product that is everyone is starting to use and it's creating a better envelope for the masses. And you, you, guys, know, and you guys wanted to go for an hour and a half. It's going to happen. I was going to say, um, it, and it's something I talk about on my podcast all the time. It's a value proposition. There shouldn't be any reason why we can't prove with real estate that the efficiency is better than the kitchen, especially because um, and Kylie posted it in the chat somewhere about um, their GBA is working on an article about Portland, Oregon and their deconstruction practices, right? Like, why do we spend so much money on the thing that we take out every 10 years? And it's because people think, well, I'm not going to live here for for more than five years. I'm only live here for seven years. And the real estate agent told me if I put in a brand new shiny kitchen, I'm going to get more money for my house. And you want to be like, no, you know, if you put more efficiency into the house, then every successive person who lives here afterwards will also be comfortable in this house. And they're not going to take it out because that's hard to do. So its value, you know, continues on. And so I think uh, it's, it's definitely a real estate problem. Yeah. And, and a value you, can't, proposition. you can't see energy efficiency in a picture. Yeah. Well, you can if you have an infrared camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't know how many realtors are posting infrared photos of their houses that they're listing. I don't know. Uh, well, maybe how, they um, should. Maybe they should. They should. Well, <laughs> Might be able to no, fake that, though. That's the other problem is um, it would get in the way of a sale of a house, right? Because if I build an efficient house and it's worth more because of that, then all the people who have existing houses that weren't built as well, um, you know, lose out on that value. So, um you know, in the car market where you expect people to do better on the efficiency of the cars, like we start demanding that if we start demanding that in our houses, the people who have older kind of crappier performing houses, you know, will will definitely see that. So our older housing stock, but then again, renovations are, you know, yeah, but it should be a rule. Yeah. Should should be a rule. Just like they have to disclose if there was a fire or there was something else that happened on that property. They should disclose, be forced to disclose if this thing's a leaking sieve and that utility, we got to fill the oil tank once a month in the winter. Guess what? That person will be forced to upgrade that or actually take care of that home while they had it. Not go, I'm going to run this some bitch into the ground and then sell it. <laughs> it's like driving your car and never getting an oil change. And then you're going to trade it in. You're going to trade Is it that in. bad? <laughs> But it, I'm, it's funny. I remember when I bought my first house, that was one of the questions I had asked. I said, Hey, are they able to share like the utility bills? And I have no, I think someone told me to ask that. They were like, Hey, see if they'll share. Probably like, your what, dad. Probably you know, my father. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> probably like, Hey, make sure you're not like, you know, you know what you're buying. But I remember them saying, no, they, they, they wouldn't. And I didn't care. I was like, whatever, I'm, I'm going to run it anyway. But it is, it should, they're like, to understand that. And I know we've talked about on the podcast years ago uh, about Zillow having uh, the hers rating. And now I, I think they're starting to adapt that. Some of it's on there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, Emily, one of the key words, I think what you just said is that all of this stuff should be in practice. It should be the ability to, you know, to promote this in, in efforts to, you know, build a better product, but there's a very you're absolutely right where it's tied to the the real estate agents and the fact that the you know the, the the yeah, the real estate mafia that the majority of these homes are old and underperforming and just because your house is the reality is if you sell a house that's higher performing they're going to pull that price back to what it should be selling even if it was a normal performing house and then all of the other houses that are low performing and are going to, going to drop in value. It's not going to work the other way. The, val- the, the ones that are underperforming don't stay the same and you get to sell for more. It's you're basically pushing everything down. And that's what, you know, I, I think what you're saying and what my thought is that is that's the, the risk is that you're going to um, devalue the, the, the masses by, by, by starting to promote like, Hey, this is how much better it is. And this is how home a home should be built, but it's happening. Yes, yes and no, though, right? Because that will that will like 
Johnny said, force people to take care of the things that they have, do renovations that that matter. Um, but it will also cause us to stop building a lot of really crappy stuff because to be honest, we're still doing that. And that sort of sucks. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're not setting a bar anywhere for, for people to... I think that's more important than anything else. Just like that would be more, more controllable than saying, well, you have to do certain things on a renovation. Uh, Most people who are doing renovations, I feel like don't have the, um, they're not in a position to be built. Maybe there's exceptions to this, but they're not building a huge custom home or where they can really implement a lot of these things. A lot of people are buying a house. They're renovating one room at a time and they're saving And I think it's a little, it's a, it's a, it would be tougher to kind of implement that on a larger scale where it's like, Hey, every new home that's built has to hit a certain standard. That's, that's much more, that's so much easier to implement or put standards in place than on renovations. I think the hardest part here is if we tie in craftsmanship is that (laughs) when I was a carpenter, I didn't know what craftsmanship was. and I didn't call myself a craftsman. I was a laborer for a reason because I had to learn that. And then as I grew up and, and had experience now having 24, 25 years in the business, it was daunting for me to be able to build a house, to wrap my head around all the details and build a house and just get through the construction process. Now, being in it for so long, now I can pick up subtle details that, that I know that someone will live in the home and enjoy it. Like I put my plugs centered underneath the lights for Christmas lights. Like just thinking of things that will make people's life easier. And that came with experience, but also having my, my head on a swivel. And, and at the same time, after I've not have not solved and, and totally accomplished how to build a home where I can, it's like breathing, but now I can focus on details for, it came as like general construction. Then how do I spice up more details? Cause it's fun and flashy and then able to pull back and then, Hey, how do I make it just, if I'm going to, have an impact on this world and, and, and be able to do more, even though it's four or five houses a year compared to what the massive market is, I'm not going to have an impact, but my personal impact to my market, to my clients, it needs to be something grand. It needs to be something big. I remember when I was doing like, I was taking out light bulbs and putting in the coolest light bulbs. People like think you're crazy. And I'm like, but if I do it, then they have a dinner date, then their friend might do it. And, and it might be this fairy tale. I say that someone else is going to, it's going to grow. And, but my point is, is that we didn't learn craftsmanship in overnight. And to learn building science, you have to have these accomplishments, but have it on your radar that, hey, I want to make this detail different. I, I want to you know, learn from Marvin or whoever it is that, how do I install a window right? So that way water's you know, getting away from the house, not being introduced into it. You know, foam, what do I do? What's the best option for me and my budget? And having enough time as a builder and contractor to be able to have those debates because a lot of people right now are just running a thousand miles an hour. It's like, put in whatever. Don't even look back at it. <laughs> like, what's the cheapest? Roll with it because I want, I need to get moving. I need to get my next draw. And that's where we have to find this kind of common line. You bring up a great point, John. I'm sorry, Emily, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you brought up a great point, which actually goes back to last week's episode when we talked about the living building challenge and the red list stuff. And, in some ways I feel like it has to just be easier that you can go in and get something that's that's readily available and that we know that if you're going to use x you need y and z as well and that you know like in some ways the the craftsmanship is learning how all those parts and pieces go go together for sure but it's also being able to go and get it right like if you got to spend all day. Uh, I mean, on the living building challenge, I think they said she spent like 900 hours researching products. Well, who has time for that? So, you know, then can that trickle down to, you know, being able to go to the building department and pick it up? You know, they they do all those stupid food things that are like, eat this, not that, like building materials should be the same, like use this, not that. And, you know, uh, we all improve the the there should be there right. should be like a Whole Foods for Home Depot, not, like, not an or, an yes. or, like an organic Home Depot, you know, <laughs> they had that in um, Woburn. They had like a I forget what it's called back in early 2000s. It was uh, this is another green, great idea, not green stamp, but it was something else. They had a, it was like all super green stuff. It was right over at uh, one of the drywall companies had it in Woburn. 
But it, that's a six digit idea for sure. You got to make that happen. You guys talk to your people. Green Depot. Look, nice. Green, Green Depot. Depot. <laughs> that's what it is. Green Depot. Love the chat. That's, that's killer. Think, it, it seems so difficult to me. Like right now, it's it's tough to find people who can do quality work. And I feel like most of the people in the trades there, they are more hands on there. That's that's their strong point. It's not the the technical aspect of construction. And I think that it's it's very difficult to implement the building science aspect of construction with tradespeople. I think it takes a specific person and it's hard enough to find somebody who can just set tile let alone somebody who's going to understand the scientific nature and consequences of what we're doing, where it's like, you can't even flash a window the right way. And that's just dealing with bulk water, like not even from a science perspective. And, but then you want these people to understand everything uh, that goes into this building. And it's, it seems like a, a, you know, it's that's going to be a large mountain that's in front of us that somewhat seems insurmountable. Dude, when it's I was doable, though. I did. I just put Tyvek up because I knew it was the next step. I didn't yeah. know there was a purpose behind it that I had to tape anything. I was just don't fall off the ladder when you're putting the roll up and just use a six foot roll so that we get as much done as possible. I mean, that's I see the, it. I see it all rules. the time. Every every job, you know, anywhere that I work, and you drive around and it sees these higher end homes, and it's architect signs out front that are you know predominant architects in the area and there's just so many practical building mistakes that are being made and it's like who's controlling that who's in charge of that is that the gc is that the architect is it uh you know an engineer and how are they implementing that how are they making ensuring that it's right and then i look at some of the stuff that you guys deal with and i'm like oh my god i can't even get somebody to just do something the right way a very simple task and i'm like oh now i'm going to complicate it and try and implement building science uh to the job and i'm like oh i don't know it scares it's, it, me it's funny because and we said it last uh our last podcast is like ignorance is bliss and i feel as though a lot of times with you know building science you got like there's there's people like us and you guys that are immersed in this stuff but then there's the people that choose to ignore it because it's too complex there's too many products and especially now we've talked about that where there's so many products out there like like john said it used to just be tyvek or typar like now there's so many different uh you know wrbs there's so many different products out there that it's overwhelming where the easier thing to do is just say you know what screw it like i'm but, not i, but I can't if you pay acknowledge it, it then you're responsible for it sure. but if you ignore it then it's right. like it, well, exactly. i don't know right i, I don't know hey listen like, type colors, type R, like i'm doing my thing i've but been it's doing like this the, all of those products are put into place and have been created because building practices have changed so they're there to combat Force their hand. you know yeah, I mean, even if you think of rain screens back in the day, like houses leaked so much that tar paper, building paper, and cedar shake shingles were enough. It didn't need anything else. Like the house got wet and then the house dried out. Um, all the rain slickers and all that stuff is just because we're building tighter houses now. Um, and I think that as everything, ch it's, it's going to continue to progress and grow. And with every single change that people make, it's going to have, it's going to have a trickle effect and affect two, three, four things down, down the line from there. I don't know. I, it's going to be tough to keep up with. And that's why I think it's daunting to a lot of people where it's, you know, I mean, you, if I feel like recently dew point has been such a huge topic where now all you guys are, you know, publishing things saying dew point doesn't matter. Like stop, like stop going down this rabbit hole of dew point where I know like th there's a level of it matters. I'm not saying it doesn't, but people get caught up on it and we had christine williamson on our podcast and it was like that's all i wanted to know i was like just explain to me what dew point is like i that's genuinely what why i want you on this podcast right now no but we, but but seriously it was it's such there's things like that where it's like when we don't even myself you know it's when when i don't understand things i do my very best and i and my team will do our very best but there's points where it's like all right I just, I'm not getting this. I'm not understanding this. How do I, how do I try to make a change within my practice when this is so hard to understand? And it's, and I think it's just mainly because there's so many 
there's so many opportunities, there's so many products, there's so many options, and there's and, and there's so many things that if you don't stay up with it, your 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 fear is that you're doing something that isn't right. When in reality, there you know whatever approach you take is probably just fine. It's just a different approach. Whether you use this WRB or that WRB, it doesn't matter. They're doing the same thing. Yeah, if you want to look at the specs on the paper, maybe one has a better perm rating or, 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 or is better in this climate for this reason. But the reality is you've, you've already went 80%, 85% of the way there. You've made a difference in, in your building practice. And those last few percentages, yeah, they might matter when you start getting into you know a really like passive house level building. But for the general population, you're built, you're already in that, that better product category. But, and is, isn't that, or just listening to you describe that, it also sounded like to me, that's, that's, that, that is the intersection of craftsmanship and building science. It's like, isn't that like understanding, you know, learning what the options are, why, why you might do something a certain way, why this other approach is a bad idea. Uh, this is how, you know, this, these are the products that the cool kids are using. So they're probably worth looking at. This is how the old timers did it. This is how you can do it 100%. profitably. Like that's, that, that is where building science and craftsmanship overlap to me. And, and it's, yeah. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, I think we're in a unique uh, error with all of this because product development is happening so quickly, but product awareness is happening even faster like you just said like all the cool kids are using it it's like the biggest guy on social media is using using this product i got to use that product i want to know what uh, what it's about and we've seen them i want to slam my head against the wall you just said that because that's what a lot of people are doing and it's, but it is no, and no one no one's backing that guy up he would right. just sold a product he got paid to post it and no one knows don't hate don't hate oh, okay. i know i'm gonna i'm on a different podcast i'm gonna be that guy <laughs> I just, have we hit I just, any of your have we hit any of your topics so far or do we just completely hijack this <laughs> thanks for no, being so on guys. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, have no, I, I have no idea what travis's list was i couldn't find it so sure yeah, you hit I them can, all yeah. um but i i want to go back to something that tyler said which is um i think the intersection of building science and craftsmanship as well is that Building durability is probably the biggest building science thing that you can do. So, I mean, let's forget about insulation. It's not important in all of the different parts of the country. Let's forget about, you know, all that stuff is building durability is craftsmanship, right? If you can't install a window properly with flashing, then then you're going to be taken it apart. Or I'm sure you guys as renovators have taken apart. I mean, Travis just posted something about stucco that he took apart that was pretty scary and that you know that's a, a building science issue too like we're talking about recycling and all this materials and stuff but like if we're taking stuff down every five years because we're building a whole bunch of crappy stuff then that's not craftsmanship and it's not building science either so it's just bad building um, yeah there's a real desire for people to be on trend in in the building science sector as well you know when people got excited about dew point like you said um, you know, vapor open everything. I, I had a really fun conversation with someone about uh, a zip system and Delta vent SA and Henry blue skin. And then we realized at the end of the conversation that we were talking about applying all those, um, over an OSB skin, like, Oh yeah. So the permeability of the product almost doesn't matter because the OSB is so low perm right. that it's not really permeable. So maybe we should just shift the conversation away from what's on trend from the manufacturers and really talk about your specific project and that's really what we need to do uh, and that's where the craft is alive when when you're with a client and they're telling you about their dream you're bringing everything you got to the table for sure uh in terms of you know your background your experience the failures you've seen the things that you fixed as a remodeler the johnny's background didn't you do inner, deep energy retrofits before you were vintage builders builders yeah. johnny like you're you've got some some chops here so you're, you're bringing all that to the table when you roll into the room and you play your cards, man. The house, the house needs this. The budget is that, and you got to make it work. And the craft, in my view, uh, and and part of what's going to perpetuate that for the next people that need to get into this to to make it all make the world keep going around, is introducing the the physics and the science side of it, and then sharing the joy in the craft of that level too. Because as much fun as it is 
to hand cut dovetails or to even do them on my dovetail jig, which I don't know if that's a hack or not. I don't have a, a Japanese pull saw, but I've got a sweet Porter cable do dovetail jig that works just fine with my router. You want us to I, cut this from the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no, man. No, I, I'm open about it. I got no shame. The, the idea of, of performing that detail to a level that I believe my client will enjoy, and more importantly, in my mind, the responsibility of making it so that the next owner and the next owner and the generation after that enjoy that detail as well, back to Emily's point about the durability, that craft applies to completing your air barrier. The same level of attention to detail, 100%. the same passion for making it happen for the people that are going to be there for the next hundred years. It's the same. It's just a different application. So I guess my question is, is like we, we joke about you know running our businesses and, you know, you know Brad AFT, I, I love him. And I'm like, when did you start stepping away from your business? He's like four years in. So if you were to take that as a carpenter or as GC or whatever, and yeah, you may have never dovetailed the first five years you were a carpenter. So when in your you know, timeline should building science be introduced? And when do you think that you're capable where you're not running around like an idiot trying to react to stuff and that this you're trying to, you know, not being convenient, not going to Home Depot and going, what's on the shelf? Like, when do you think if someone's listening to this, that they should be aware of this? Like, like I look at it this when we're having this conversation realistically, starting a business, the people that go into the green niche will build some awful looking products <laughs> and it's not a great brand. I'm being honest. I was in Boston Green Building forever where we joke and say, you know, I was talking to Place Taylor the other day and it was like, yeah, a lot of the, that market is people with $100,000 trying to squeeze $200,000 out of it. Mm -hmm. And what's left over is that you're going to, put Ikea cabinetry in because you put all your money into the envelope and it sounds almost like an addiction. Um, but my point is, is that to the craftsmanship part, you want to be able to post that sexy picture, that sexy exterior, whatever it is, that detail. And you're not going to get notoriety. You know, your brand's not going to get recognized and you're not going to get the next job from an architect unless you know how to execute that part. But if you put a, a cross section of a building assembly in you know, is a client really going to comprehend it? And there's probably like seven architects out of 45 that will appreciate it. Let's be honest. You get me like, just like if someone's young getting into this, what are they supposed to focus on? You know, all everyone's saying craftsmanship, but at what point do you need to start mixing in a little bit of building science and, and all the little things that, that could, when you get older, freak you out and <laughs> you lose. I, did, I don't think that you up at night. <laughs> I think everyone, everyone, just, wants, everyone wants to, to say talk. elementary school. <laughs> right? It, it's right now they're they're so independent of each other, and we need to do a better job of overlapping the two. Because I like even if you think like craftsmanship or design, like there's aesthetic design, there's scientific design, uh, and it's two different brain types, it's two different people, but they they shouldn't be independent of each other, and like you can be a craftsman by crafting a home that's energy efficient and that's well built, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be good on the tools. Um, it, I don't think it has to be something that is necessarily a, a hands-on approach. I think it's, it's having the knowledge of what you're doing and understanding that entire building assembly and what affects what, and you making one change to that building how that affects every other sub trade, how that affects every product that you use down the road. And I, I think that we, we need more people rather than specializing in all of these things. We need somebody planted on these jobs that understands all of those things. Because right now it's like you bring this, the window guy in who doesn't understand what, you know, finished material you're putting on the exterior and he's implementing certain techniques for, you know, uh, a cement board siding when it's supposed to be stucco, this, that, and the other thing where they're just running and gunning and then they're on to the next job and it doesn't necessarily matter. And I think there need, there needs to be people on board who understand the building science aspect, but also the actual building. And right now it, it's very, they're very independent of each other. I think we can bridge that gap though. We can start that. I mean, 
Emily was probably a little bit uh, tongue in cheek, but yeah, elementary school, I think is, uh, is not out of reach. We, we can, we can apply uh, both the science and the craft in shop class. You can explain why you do something. That's, that's what this, that's what craft is about. Um, you know, dovetails weren't cut in just to be pretty. It holds the damn drawer front on the why the understanding of the why function is really, I think what drives the curious person to move to the next step. So if like, on that job that Emily mentioned earlier. So I was supposed to put in a couple windows on Monday. Simple job. Take the old window out, put the new window in, new trim, pretty, on to the next job. Took the windows out and the moles had leaked. The OSB's black. Oh, there's no WRB behind here. It's just paperback lads straight to the OSB. Solar vapor drive. The whole wall's toast. So by Monday afternoon, I'm ordering LVL instead of taping windows. Kind of a crummy way to start the week. But it gave me a great opportunity because I've got my guy, Quentin, who's been with us three years now, who's he's kind of my he's my air sealing guy now. I've been, I've been working with him on this. And as much as I talk to him about how to efficiently let out studs on the wall and how I do my lighting layout and how I want him to pull my wires flat, he's getting that full blown. Hey, we're going to stand here and talk for 20 minutes and I'm paying you to listen. So listen, this is why this failed. Here's where the flashing was deficient. Here's the failure in the, the original builder in thinking that the paperback lab was going to be enough protection when that first layer of paper is going to be saturated. It has nowhere else to go. The sun's heated up the stucco. It's going in, man. And when you have that conversation with these people on site, you can kind of tell when they start to glaze over. And that's when you got to get a little shorter with, uh, with the description and the explanation. But you can plant those seeds. And every time it comes up again and again and again, you bring that together. And I really think in shop class, we could be explaining that when we talk about cutting dovetails, you could say, we're not just cutting these because they look cool on the side of the box. And everyone that wants to buy cabinets from me is like, well, do you have dovetail drawers? Because if you explain that the obvious physics of this are that when I pull on this, the wedge can't come out of the other wedge, it's the wrong shape. That's what makes this durable. That's why it's beautiful aesthetically to be too, because it's functional. Those are hand in glove, man. I think this is this is a solvable problem for our industry. As long as we have people like you three, like people that have been on this show before, like all those people you see on Instagram doing cool stuff, but actually being responsible about it and not just posting a pretty picture, but actually saying, this is why, this is why that miter joint has to be closed. It's not just because I want to look cool sliding this complex coat profile right into the next one. It's because in doing so, when there's seasonal movement, that caulk is going to be just fine. You're not going to have to come back and touch it up. We coped it. You're welcome. But nobody, like, I think that one of the big issues, nobody has to ask why anymore. The, the, the knowledge is so immediate and you can just get somebody to answer your question that you never have to understand why anything works. Where it's like, what would you use in this case? And somebody's just going to hand you that answer. Where 10 years ago, 20 years ago, a hundred years ago, you had to figure out why and how it worked and pull something apart that failed to realize why it's not a good idea. And everything's so immediate now that like, I feel like there's so many people who are, they don't understand why they do anything that they do. They just do it because somebody told them or they saw somebody do it that way or somebody posted on Instagram and then it catches wildfire. And it's like, like, for example, the, when somebody incorrectly roughs in a toilet supply and instead of moving it, they like trim around it and bring like, and so everyone thinks that that's a really nice architectural detail and well, just kids does it and then post, Hey, look, you know, we didn't want to notch it into the top of the cap. So we drew all this attention to it. It's like, no, move the plumbing supply, but nobody asks why they see it. Somebody posted it. And it's like, perfect. You know, let's all do that on all of our plumbing supplies now. And it's let's this, celebrate it. Every it's single this, job, it's this little a little up and down it's terrible and it's it's the same <laughs> thing with building science and everyone else somebody sees somebody use a, a a certain type of sheathing and well hey they used it so i'm gonna use it and they don't actually they don't find anything out about it or they they ask somebody a question they don't go to the rep they don't go to the company they don't go to their lumber yard and sit down with somebody and ask them a question they rely on an immediacy of getting an answer from somebody else without actually digging into that product well, and that 
or that I think brings up a good point as well that that I um, I think we we've been sort of treating building science as a synonym for building performance or green building or or hydrothermal performance, but um, and there's not as as far as I know there's not like one official building science definition, but to me it's basically everything science about everything we do on putting a house together. So yes, there's a lot of importance in in what moisture is doing, even vapor drive, but especially bulk water issues and 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 thermal efficiencies and all that. But it's also, you know, how does your HVAC system work? What kind of of thin set are, are are you using? Are you using modified or unmodified mortar? Is it is it? Um, I think where uh, you're oh, get yeah. you, what you're getting at is it's not you know building science doesn't mean that you're in the top tier. You're not built. It doesn't mean you're no, no, building just, a passive house. It's what's the, the science behind what we're doing? It's, yeah, <laughs> it's the basic under having the basic understanding of the why. Um, I want to go think back. It needs to get rephrased. I, for it to be yeah. adopted by more like the science part. A lot of people sucked at science class. It's, you know what? Not, that, that's that's science. People failed it. Like, like people don't know when to use modified versus unmodified thin sets, or the reason for using them. It's just like. Somebody told him to use modified. Modified's better because it has latex modifiers in it. It'll hold better. Where that's not, you know, that's not the best application for everything. And, you know, instead of, even if you think like Schluter, when Schluter came out and you're using unmodified underneath of it because it doesn't dry. And like, if people understood why that they're using that there, it would make sense rather than just like referring to a, a service manual that's telling them what to do. They mm -hmm. don't understand the products that they're using to understand why they're using them and how they work and how it reacts with the absence of air versus when it's exposed to air. And I don't know, things just move very quickly. And I think it's tough for everyone to keep up with it. Well, John, I think your point about having it be rebranded is, is a, really interesting topic i think there's a lot of things in our industry that are labeled you know in a way that hurt us like value engineering will, will hurt it right actually yeah. yeah i mean i just feel as though there's so much and this came up the other day in a, a conversation where i'm sitting down with an architect and we're talking we're talking about value engineering things on a project and he's like i hate that word i hate it because it sounds so negative it sounds like we're ripping stuff out of a project hey, it's better than cheap Let's sure, a cheaper yeah. product. Inexpensive I mean, sounds I mean, better on. than cheap, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's but I think you're right. It's like building science, building performance. All of that sounds like oh, that. I think it's comfort. I think everybody yeah. understands comfort. That's and, fair. Yeah. And I think with everyone being home, if you have a more comfortable home, no one's going to say no to that. Right. No, and I think it's our responsibility, not the market, not the realtors, not anyone else is that yeah, they're going to pick the big screen TV every time. And they're going to pick the sound system. They're going to pick the stove that's, you know, $4,000 or $40,000, whatever it is. But it's our responsibility to pick what goes on that envelope. And I, my whole point of that is the same way you fight for the right scale for a crown holding in baseboard and, you know, beaded inset cabinetry or whatever the detail is, it comes with experience that you need to learn it the the answer I was looking for was in the beginning, you're right, is that at the same time you learn craftsmanship, you should learn building science because they go hand in hand and it's your responsibility. A designer might pick the cabinetry, the paint color and all those little details. A client might pick the same things. You will be the only person that picks for the most part what goes into the things that never get seen and that you will get the callbacks when it goes poorly. We can connect. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think you're right about the rebranding in, in both aspects. One to the homeowner, what you need to sell the homeowner is comfort, security, not resilience and building science, right? They don't know that. They don't care about that. That sounds complicated. You know, we, we that got sounds your dew point right. <laughs> yeah. They're going to be like, what? I, but in the same time, I think that it, it, you're, you bring up a valid point about carpenters who are already there. You're like, they didn't like science. They failed science. One, because science maybe wasn't applied to something they actually find interesting. So building science can, it can be really cool. But if you start out with building science and like all of a sudden it's just like, nope, not interested. And so I think when you're talking to other people in the field, you have to use 
some other level of interest in in branding it for the people who who are building it well you know? emily to be fair it's like if you if if this was just the building science show and no beer no one would show up right no one would show up right it's like it's like how do we how do we get people to join let's add beer to it that's the hook it, it helps everything but it i mean it's it's a very real topic and i think it's so it's so ingrained in our industry that there is these the terminology is so scary to so many people in all different sides of it and the building science one is just there's so much there and i and i'm repeating myself here but there's so much depth to it that people just choose to ignore it because it just sounds daunting you know you can and- connect failure though you can connect you can and i don't want to say you can scare people but you can definitely <laughs> connect failure for clients, you connect the failure to expense. So if you if you say, you know, I'm looking at uh, doing an exterior insulation detail on the house, I'd like to price that up for you, and you can consider it. You're under no obligation to move that way. But the more insulation we put outside of the house, the better your performance because we've eliminated thermal bridging. And oh, by the way, if we do that on top of your roof, think about the fact that when your roof gets redone, they're not tearing the sheathing off, especially because you guys do some spray foam up there. Spray foam on the backside of a, a, a sheet of OSB. When I tear my roof off, I'm I'm basically taking the insulation with it. You know, there's a there's an increased risk, and you can you can connect that for the client because they go, oh yeah, I had to have the re- roof redone at the last house, and I also had to pay for insulation. I don't want to pay for that again. I'm interested now. Now I'm mm-hmm. interested in maybe we do that outsulation. Maybe we were throwing comfort board on the top. I don't know. But if you if you connect it there, you can do the same thing in the field with your, your entry level carpenter and say, hey, I know that we're gonna put windows in today. I want you to watch why I do this. I'm gonna tell you exactly where the water's gonna go. And mm-hmm. when we counter flash this, you're gonna see that if the water runs down the wall, it can't get back in here. Because remember last week when we were tearing out this over here and all that OSB was rotten and we also saw the jacks were rotten and the kings were rotten and we had to spend two days restructuring. We're gonna take all that away. Oh, you didn't enjoy that demo? I didn't either. Let's tie the the building science benefit and the craft to eliminating risk. And then I think everyone gets on board really fast to a point. I mean, everyone's got a budget and every craftsman has their, their quitting time, but I think it's doable. I think we can do it. And I think the more we talk about it, the more it helps. And I think that's why you guys are doing such a great thing and why I was excited to have you on. But you, you got to put it in your budget in the first place. When someone comes to you and, and you have this thing and you go, Hey, you know, there's my ballpark. Mm-hmm. don't just put the things that you don't see at the lowest value, you know, fight for it a little bit. And you'd be surprised how many people, when you push back on the insulation, the, the vapor barrier, all these the air sealing, all these things and like HRVs, like I'm not just going to put one down. So I'm going to put two in. So your mm-hmm. bedrooms are circulating because you know, blah, blah. When you get into that, it's just as important to them. Once you open them up to that, yeah. And you can speak to it that they're like, I, I see it like it's not for you and me. It's the same as saying, hey, should I remove that asbestos downstairs or should I just go over it with carpet? You should fucking remove it. Sorry. It's <laughs> like it's this is things that will change your life. This is why kids will have asthma. This is why certain things happen. You, you spend so much time in your air quality inside your house is usually worse than what's outside, especially now when it's cold out and no one's been leaving their homes. It, this is something that's crucial to people and, and we ignore it and people just wonder why everyone's sick and mm-hmm. why all this is happening. And, and this is something that, like I said, it's our responsibility to be able to speak to it and have that line item in there to push back on. Yeah. yeah it, and on a related note, uh, Meredith, I mentioned earlier in the chat, uh, basically paraphrasing, it's, it's we can all make something that looks good on day one. But it's if there's craftsmanship and good building science behind it, it's when it still looks good after five years. It's still there after ten years. It it, it ages gracefully. It it stays healthy. Like a, or a lot of moisture issues don't show up for ten years. So like zip sheathing's only been around for twelve years. Like um, most of our building materials can can be pretty resilient and hide stuff for ten years. But then then you start to see the issues. Tiles will stay stuck for ten years, but then they'll start loosening up if there's too much flex it's like that's that's part of craftsmanship and part of good building science is 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 knowing what's going to last um you know if not 100 years at least is it going to last 20 years i do you think that we're building 
to a level um, with new construction that things can last that long. I, I feel like so many products that are out there now just aren't made to last that long. And it's possible. Yeah. Like I, I feel as though half of my job is putting in extra effort to make things that aren't necessarily produced that well last as long as I can, where it it's, it's gone. I don't know. It's gone so far in the opposite direction. And I think that even design from an aesthetic standpoint, when you look back to period architecture, there was, it was form and function and it doesn't seem like we really blend those two now it, it seems like it's one or the other you know people want to design something that looks good or something that um performs well and it it doesn't seem like anyone really has the opportunity to do both until you get into that super high-end market which like i always wonder would would an architect you know if not a lot of if people are putting stuff out to bid like if that were on the bid set those details were on the bid set or were on the plans from like an architectural standpoint or at the beginning of the design phase how much more of a difference it would make because like if somebody comes to you with a set of plans and you're selling a high-end insulation package or a very uh well performing home versus somebody who's like well i can get you like rut cabinetry in there but it's apples to oranges and people don't even know it's not a level playing field i don't know like if if getting architects on board you know and really having the the design driven by building science and by aesthetics how much more that would help because if it's left in the hands of builders um i don't know if it's going to happen I have yeah. lots to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think if we were all like Steve Basic, who needs to understand absolutely everything that's in there, the the drawings are on um, the set from the very beginning, the homeowner has bought in. But as you are well aware, the architect builder relationship isn't that great. And I will be just as hard on a lot of architects out there. You were right when you said like, one in 45 architects might understand building science. That's a failure on, on our part for things that should get in there. And we've gotten a little bit bad. And I think Christina said this in the past about like the architect will say, pawn it off on the builder, like verify in the field or do this. And the builder will say, well, it wasn't on the drawings, right? So nobody's taking ownership of anything, which really sucks. That's not good for anybody. Um, but at the same time, I also think we should not be bidding projects. Um, I personally think that's just a terrible idea for exactly what you said. Um, but we also should be bidding what's on there. So, you know, the last time I've moved away from bid work, it never works out for me. Um, but the last yeah, time I so, did. But what, so hold on, but when did that start? You couldn't do that from the beginning. You had to build a relationship with certain people that you trusted. So like <sighs> just to define it, it's none of this is like click your finger and it's there. It's you have to. Sure feel it out and understand what it is it's the same as subs we might want to nick right. want to do all get rid of close off foam and do all these cool practices it's like i can't do any of that until i find the right group of people that are my subs well john i mean right you know i lost a big job uh a few months ago because of that we we took a it was designed very average spray foam insulation two by six wall like no building science met with the architect I had thought I'd done a pretty good job selling the job to the client. Like, Hey, this is our approach. This is the, these are the things that matter. This is our price point. We hit our price point, but when it was all broken down and they realized, Oh, you're that's your price point, but this, your price points that because you're spending this much on improving the insulation details, I literally lost the job. And, and it was, you know, and they were just like, Hey, you're, you're taking this to a level that we don't appreciate. Like in, in the sense, like, not that we don't appreciate what you do. It's just, it doesn't matter to us. That's not, those aren't the things that we appreciate in a, in a, a um, in a design a magazine for a photo. Right. So, and it's like, and, and I could, and I could have adjusted, you know, I could have said, you know what, fine. I'll, I can, I can, it was $200,000. We, Hey, we can peel back $200,000 on the budget and still build this house and, you know, change the way we approach it. But we decided to walk away because it wasn't our project anymore. But John has a good point. It's like, 
yeah, I don't, I tell people I don't bid work either, but I'll be damned if a, a great architect reaches out to me tomorrow and it's like someone I want to work with. I'm like, yeah, all right, I'll build, I'll bid that job. And it's you, but there's this level of confidence, right? Yeah. It's, you know, you don't go into it. I didn't start this in my career saying, Hey, listen, I heard online. I don't bid work. <laughs> it, it was, it was, this, it was this, and I'm not and Emily, I'm looking directly at you, but I'm not, uh, not attacking it, but it's like, it, there is this, there is this threshold that it's like, you kind of have to, you, you're going to have to get beat up a little bit. And then once you get that confidence you, and you're confident, not only to, to sell it, but also confident in your approach because it's been done and you've proven you it back it up. Yeah. And you, and you can prove it. Then it's like, Hey, this is how we operate. You know, no frills. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Everybody has to start from the bottom. I mean, people aren't building kitchen cabinetry on day one, right? Like you're going to learn how to build carpentry in a shop and someone's going to let you build a box first and then maybe they'll let you build something that's nice, right? Well, none of us do anything from the beginning. The bid thing though, I think has never served anyone and I don't know why any of us do it, right? I, you I, you do have to build those relationships and I, and I totally agree with that. And I didn't do it when I first started out because, you know, you, you have to do some other things, but, you know, even when I was doing a lot of public housing projects, as when you take the lowest bid, you're going to get that. That is yeah. exactly, you're going to get the junk that you have. And when you put it out and you get six totally wildly different bids, that means nobody looked at any of the stuff that was on here. Nobody cared. Nobody was invested. And so interviewing three builders during the design phase, right? Cause you know, we want to do integrated design. Um, then they, have a relationship with it because they're going to spend a lot of time with you, right? You're going to be on their job site every day for a certain amount of time. It's more important the relationship you have with them than the price they're getting. But that we always have to talk about price, right? I mean, I mean realistically, the- we're in, in order to hit that level, you have to, and like even to not bid work, I feel like you have to put yourself into a price point that's mid to higher end construction. And like, that's, I, that's not the bulk of our industry. That's not the bulk of the building industry. I think that most of it's below that, which is, which is tough for us. It's what we run into, you know, it, and again, not taking craftsmanship being independent of building science versus trades, but like we have to, in order to be able to execute at this level, we need money. Yeah, but I want to say something in response to that, which is, do you bid every project with your plumber or do you just use the same plumber because you know he'll show up and he might be a little bit more expensive, but he's worth it every time, right? So in the same respect is you don't build bid every trade, right? Because you've created a relationship. Well, yeah, to respect to my subs, I try and take a, a formula and a multiplier based on whatever the size project is. So that way I'm not wasting your time. But when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of it, once the product's been awarded to me based on a, a general budget, then they do have to come in and price it, but I'm not having them do a dance. But I'm also not bidding my plumber out because I know what I'm getting for my plumber. And then it's my job to sell that to my customers. You know, like I wouldn't want to go to a customer and then be like, you know what, that plumbing number looks a little high. Let's, let's get two other plumbers in here because then I don't, from what I do, I'm not bringing any value to my customers by coming in with a lower plumbing number and not performing the way that we want to. Like I'd rather bring to the table the best option and say like, Hey, this is who we want to use. He, maybe he's not the least expensive plumber, but I don't want to use any other plumber, but it's, uh, it's not, it's, it's then up to me to kind of sell that, which is a bummer because if I, we're looking at a lower dollar job, I wouldn't be able to use that plumber because he's going to be more than somebody else. Um, and not everyone can necessarily afford him, which is it. Right. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to bid it. They just might have, you know, not everybody can afford an A-level builder. Not everybody can afford a custom home, right? Not everybody can do that. But I do community action projects with homeowners who build their own home. They use the same insulation guy every time, right? Because you're you're going to bat for that. So you're selling that. And what I think what I'm trying to say is we're we're not selling the builders and the craftsmanship to the market, right? So that you have to do that stuff. And that's not fair. 
right? No, I, I don't think, and I'm, I'm with you a hundred percent. I don't think that anyone benefits from bidding jobs. It, it's like, it's a race to the bottom. And I think that everyone's cutting, cutting their prices, cutting their scope, uh, putting in products that cost less money. And I feel that's like the bane of our industry. It's so price driven and that everyone wants to get a deal and they don't understand the value of uh, a well built, a well assembled building or project. It's, it's so price driven and that it's so cutthroat and that people are putting out products that or hiring people who are less money to get their foot in the door to sell a job. And then the building doesn't last. Or like you're saying with stucco, there's developments around me that 15 years in they're redoing the entire development because like they built every single house the same way. Nobody questioned anything and they're tearing off all the, all the stucco. They're ripping out all the windows, they're reframing. And it, it's, it's just insane to me that, that, our industry is built around this this price driven you have to come at a certain price point we have to put this out to bid and it's in my opinion it's it's horrible for everyone nobody benefits from that it's it's such a good point you ever drive by a house and in it's on your way to a job site and you see the same house you see it going up you see it going together then you see it like getting taken apart and when I was younger, I used to be like, oh, it was poor craftsmanship. Like any client would be like, it's poor this. And then now I drive by and go, I wonder what the budget was. I wonder what, like, I wonder what the design detail was in the architecture. Like I ne now I rarely blame the actual GC or the, or the guy that's on the ground, guy or girl on the ground doing the work. It's more of like, what do you think the parameters were to make that situation happen? It's also, it's so much lack of education. At oh, the it's end of the minimum day. code. You know? yeah, and it's just people don't know and people aren't teaching and architects aren't going and showing, you know, builders aren't showing the next person why they're doing this. Like if I'm on a job, I have to actually step back and be like, Hey, this is why I'm doing this. Where it's no, you're, you're, you know, you have your head down, you're trying to get through it. You're trying to make a dollar. You're trying to get onto the next job. And I don't, I don't think that a lot of people understand why they're doing certain things, why they're using certain products. And it, I think that it, so much of it, it's, it's a lack of formal education or a lack of a training. Um, again, people are getting into the trades because a lot of other things didn't work out for them. Um, and you're, you're working on people's homes, you're building their homes. A lot of times that's their biggest investment in their entire lives. And I don't think we always have the pick of the litter. Sorry to knock on you guys, Nick and John. <laughs> no, well, well, that brings up a, a point that was repeated in the chat box quite a, 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 a few, few times, which is uh, uh, basically who's responsible for sort of, um, establishing what happens on a job so like some people would say it's the architect's job to figure out what to do to to come to the job to show the carpenters and contractors what they're supposed to be doing but how many jobs do you guys do with architects you guys are are relatively high-end market uh, do you work with architects on every job half your jobs do you do all your own design i'd say 50 50. yeah right now so just like if there's not even an architect involved then how can an architect be the one responsible for that but, or should but we have more architecture or should it be more of a group effort? It's a, I think it's a group effort. No, yeah. no, no doubt. There should be more architects involved for everything that we do. But that again, comes down to budget where it's like, but, if you're doing a kitchen, there should be, there should be formal design involved in right. that. But like, Oh, we're going to hire an architect for, you know, or a designer for 10 grand. Well, that that's, then we can't get the cabinets we want. Right. No, but let's just even peel it back a little bit more. You're going to do a facelift. We're going to rip it apart, but the goal is to leave the sheetrock. And then you start pulling it apart. The tile pulls the sheetrock off, well, however they did it. And then you expose the wall. And the question comes up, what do we fill the wall cavity with when there's probably something that's settled down to the bottom inch of the, of the, the, the wall cavity? Like, what do we fill it with? And your goal is to get back to sheetrock as fast as possible. Most of the time, it's whatever the minimum code is. What do I have to get away with? And it's what, what the building inspector said to me the other day. He goes, it's the minimum you have to build to and the maximum I can in instruct you to do. Yeah. And it's like, that's how we build. And, and that it's when you look at it as if it's the minimum, that, that should never be the standard that you're building to because it's never going to build you a brand or your name because it's what people value now. How do we, how do we push that forward?
How do we try and I think I like to look at that master builder that's died. And how do you build for something that's a hundred years that could be passed down from generation to generation? That's what the, 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 the line should be. And if building science and comfort were part of the mix, I, I mean, I think every, let's say, I mean, maybe dads just ignore it, but I think every mom will be like, you know, the kitchen's freezing or like, I feel like my wife notices every cold spot in my entire house when I walk around and it's like, I know. And I hate my first floor, even my, my new puppy. She hates certain rooms because they're cold. And it, it's, it's simple, simple things that if you can make it comfortable, I think people will pay anything for it. I mean, look at the car industry. You're making cars that are super comfortable because you're in it for X amount of time. Why wouldn't you do that for your house? Why wouldn't you? And why wouldn't you put in the same effort you put into some crazy cool window that shows you so much nature in your office that like we're building a project right now. And I'm like, how do we even insulate this thing? It's all glass. I'm like, what am I doing? So we're like, how do we make it comfortable? Should we offer radiant heat? You know, it's a design build as we go. So it's like, you know, how putting forced hot air in here, is it going to do the job? That's where my mind is. When we're framing that build, my mind is stuck when, when they're on the couch watching TV, is the back of their neck going to be freezing because you can't wrap it in a blanket? Like, what am I going to do? If they call me and go, hey, what do I do? And it's not because it's a draft. It's because just, just the, the loss from that glazing is going to create that draft. That's where my mind freaks up. Just tell them to wait for the sun to come up. Right? But like, what should we... What, give it 12 it, hours, you'll be fine. But it's our responsibility at this moment in time, before it gets to the point of no return, to go all the way back to that whole prefab wall sections and crap, that, you know, it's our time right now to... It's a short moment that we have to be able to correct this as a builder, to see it and correct it and, and coach them into the right position where, hey, when they sit down... I know in my heart of hearts that they're going to be comfortable when they watch the Bruins game or whatever. I think, um, yeah, go Bruins. Huge hockey fan. Um, but anyway, <laughs> totally the sidebar there because we only have five five minutes. But you said something really important, and this is um, something that came up on the podcast that I recorded this week with Lloyd Alter, which is people don't buy um, – I mean, they buy things somewhat on price, but everybody buys on emotion, right? They'll yeah. pay pretty much anything for that, whatever the connection is that you've made to to some, you know, emotional part of it. So that comfort, you know, if you promised your wife a house that didn't have any cold spots, she'd probably be all over that. So um, we have it's to a, remember it's on a that. Podcast. She she wants this house <laughs> to be <laughs> comfortable. Yeah. So. Um, Go ahead, Travis. You look like you're going to say something. Well, it's just that time of night. You know, we're, we're hitting up on, on the end of the show. We like to give everyone a chance to kind of go party shots around the room. Uh, I feel like I've already run my mouth too much tonight, and I can't see the visual cues of people's faces when they're getting bored and glazing over. So I'm going to say my thanks to you guys for joining us. I really enjoyed the conversation. But take this opportunity and, you know, get your, get your last words in. What, what do you think we need to change to make this better? How can we continue to uh, interweave craftsmanship and, and, and building science? Or, or what do you want to just say? I, I just want final, final thoughts and thank everyone again. I mean, I'll Jump jump first. I'll Nick, jump in. Nick, Nick. I think, I think what it really comes down to, and we all say this all the time, that it's a, a collaborative effort. It has to be collaborative. And, you know, that's right from our sales process, from the initial meeting, everything, you know, with the client, the architect, the builder, it's, this is going to be a collaborative effort in all aspects from, you know, work, you know, from execution to budget to schedule and design and there's going to be different percentages i'm not going to be doing 50 percent of the design but i'm going to weigh in with it on feasibility and, and the way we like to approach things so uh, essentially aligning ourselves in this triangle of hey we all have the same goal let's equally agree how to get there that's so diplomatic it's so cute thanks john i just think that the accountability stick falls on us and when the house doesn't perform the way it should be the odds, no offense, you're going to get an architect on the phone and say, yeah, we designed it poorly. Instead of pushing it on to us, the builder or contractor, guess what? It's on you. And to the people getting into this business, I don't think it should be 100% building science or 100% craftsmanship. You should have eyes wide open. 
And if it means having something that's modularly built, I wouldn't turn that down either. If it, if it increases your effort of execution, that's the what, definition of craftsmanship is execution. What if the architect didn't get final payment until they lived in the house? They wouldn't take the job. <laughs> Straight up, like, come on. I'm just I saying. would take it for my to, jobs. You have to get final inspections and get them in the house. Uh, I, I'm, I'm on board with Nick. I'm going to be cute. I think that uh, it needs to be more of a synergistic approach to design and building. I think that it needs to be all of those parts going together. I think that everyone has to understand um, every consequence of what goes into a building and have a greater knowledge of how those things work together. I think right now, everything, um, there's different sectors and everything's, you know, specialized. And I, I don't think that everything's working together to kind of create an entire, an entire product. I think that it's kind of putting all of these different people in place and everyone kind of doing their own independent job and not overlapping or looking out for the next guy. And uh, I think that if, if it were more of a team approach and a collaborative effort that I think that houses and projects would probably be better built. But I think that um, a lot of times because of budget and timelines, it's kind of one person gets in and gets out and whatever's easiest for them and not necessarily thinking about the next person. Well said. I appreciate you guys coming on tonight. Everyone that joined us, the comments in the chat, which I couldn't see, but I'm sure we're excellent. Uh, my fellow co-hosts and our panelists, thanks everyone. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks guys.